Hey everybody, it's Database Bob here. Um, today I am not in my office again. I am at the University of Houston um, in the Computer Science Department and I'm visiting the famous Gwenning Chen. Gwenning, thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, it's, it's a nice, nice place to visit. Um, and I especially thank the computer science department at the University of Houston for letting me use this very, very high quality whiteboard, uh, which is again better than the one in my office. Um, so this is going to be a quick and convenient introduction to ray functions ray functions in the context of volume rendering and volume visualization. This video is dedicated to Katie Langford, uh, who's theoretically studying hard for her data viz exam coming up. So today's little tutorial has three parts. Well, first, we're going to talk about an intensity profile then we're going to talk about ray functions, and then we're going to talk about ray traversal, three different approaches to ray traversal. Um, in the first part, this is again supposed to be a person's head sitting inside a volume. That's the observer again. This is image space. So that's, that's the 2D space that the 3D scene is projected onto. It's the corresponds to the screen of the computer we're working on. This is what we call object space. Or 3D. Or the volume. The volume that we're trying to visualize or the, the volumetric data. I see I have a, a line missing. <clears throat> now, what happens in ray tracing, or I'm sorry, what happens in ray casting? We're talking about ray casting. So, remember, um, it's a good idea to watch the videos on ray casting and ray tracing, the brief comparison, before this one. Um, and also, it's a good idea to um, watch the video on the shear warp factorization maybe after this one actually I'll put links to those in the comments so what happens when we cast a ray into the volume again for every pixel in image space we cast a ray into the volume right and then the ray enters the volume let's say this is the Let's say I'm going to try to visualize the enter, entrance point to the volume. That's the intersection of the ray with the volume. And as soon as the ray enters the volume or starts to enter the volume, it generates something called an intensity profile. So as the ray traverses the volume, it samples the data inside the volume, right? And here, it starts to generate an intensity profile. So the first thing in this example that the ray hit, hits may be air, right? Which is a very low density compared to the, the soft tissue and the hard tissue in the person's head. So that corresponds to a low scalar value. Then the next thing that the ray might hit might be the skin, right? Which, uh, which might be here, right? So there'll be a jump in density when the ray hits the skin. And then the ray, I don't know what the ray is going to hit. Maybe it hits a tooth. After it hits the, the, the skin, there'll be a dip. Maybe, maybe 
the ray hits some soft tissue, but there'll be a big jump if the ray hits a tooth, right? Then maybe the ray will traverse some more soft tissue, and maybe it hits the skull, it hits bone, and it hits soft tissue, and it hits different things as it's traversing the skull, and then it exits out the rear, right? I'll say that's the, I'll donate, I'll, I'll denote that as the exit, exit point in the volume. So the ray exits, right? So as the ray traverses the, the volume for every pixel, it generates an intensity profile. So the depth is along the z-axis, and then the scalar value that we're sampling in the volume is along the y-axis, right? And this is not an accurate intensity profile. It's just an example, right? As the ray traverses different objects or tissues, the intensity pro profile is going to go up and down depending on the density of the, of the data value stored in the voxels. So that's... That's the first part, understanding what an intensity profile is and that every ray cast into the volume, and there's one ray per pixel, generates an intensity profile. Right? So that's part one. Now part two, we're, we're going to talk about ray functions. So. This is a schematic of a sample intensity profile. It's a pretty random intensity profile. It doesn't, it's just an example. It doesn't correspond to anything in particular exactly. Now, the ray can return different kinds of information from the volume. And depending on what we want to see or what we want to get out of the volume, we can't visualize every single scalar value in the volume, otherwise we would just see the sides of a block. So we have to decide what do we want to see inside the volume? What information do we want to gather? And what data values do we want to project from 3D to 2D? And we can use different ray functions to help us with that. So the first ray function is called the maximum intensity projection, right? So it corresponds to a ray, and the ray just returns, it samples all the data values along its path, and it returns always the maximum value that it encounters, right? Uh, this is an accumulative, an accumulation ray function and it simply adds up all the values that it encounters along the way. So it will sample the volume, traverse the depth, and it will simply add the values together. This is an average function. So the average function, again, will, will add the, the different scalar values together, and then it will divide the value by a normalization factor, the number of values that it samples. So it takes an average of the samples. And then we have something called a fir first hit ray casting. And this simply returns for every ray the first value that it encounters. Right? And this, these kinds of projections result in different kinds of images. And we'll, we saw examples of those in the slides in class. So the maximum intensity projection often returns information that corresponds to the densest part of the, the um, volume data. One of the funny artifacts about the maximum intensity projection ray function is that objects behind other objects can be projected in front of them to, on the viewing plane. So the depth is not preserved when we, when we use this kind of projection. And the way we can construct the, 
3D model in our minds is by rotating the volume. The depth of the different objects, objects doesn't come out very well until we start rotating the volume. Accumulation and averaging are very similar. Uh, the average ray function results in a visualization that looks similar to an x-ray. So we've all seen x-rays, we know what they're like. And then the first hit, it, it, it can result in visualizations that look like surfaces that can correspond to isosurfaces, for example. If we use the first hit ray casting on the hit data set, we would see the person's skin, right? So that's a brief summary of the four different ray functions. Now, there, those are just four typical different ray functions. That's not all the ray functions. This is an introduction to, say, four basic ray functions. There are, there are many more. I don't know how many more there are, but there have been a lot more than that developed. And then the third part of this is ray traversal three basic approaches to ray traversal. Now as the, ray, as the rays traverse the volume data, they generate an intensity profile and they sample the volume data. So there are different ways to sample the volume data, right? <clears throat> And there, I tried to draw three different ways on the board. One, the first one is regular sampling. So that means these are three rays traversing a volume. In the regular sampling case, the distance between samples along the ray is always the same. Right? So this distance is supposed to be the same as this distance, and so on. That's the idea. That's why it's called regular sampling. Now, of the three, of the three techniques here, this is the most computationally expensive because the samples usually don't fall on the edges of the voxels. So when when a sample falls in the middle of a voxel or somewhere not on the edge that results, in order to, to get the, the sample value, we have to interpolate the four values at the, at, the, at the cell. So this requires more interpolation, the regular sampling, than the other techniques. So it's, it's a naive approach to, to, to sampling. However, it's the most computationally expensive of the three. The next one is the simplest and the fastest, but the least accurate. So we have a ray, it enters a voxel, and we simply take the value at the center of the voxel every time. So we first take the value at the center of this voxel, we first take the center of this voxel, and so on. And notice there's a big gap between these two, between these two samples. So it's quick. It doesn't require interpolation, but it's the least accurate. And then the voxel intersections ray traversal sampling approach uh, tries to strike a balance between these two. So it samples the volume at all of the voxel intersections. So I've tried to draw this visibly. So every time the ray hits an edge of a voxel, it samples the data. And the idea is that the interpolation is simpler. In two dimensions, it's, a, it's one linear interpolation. So one linear interpolation along this edge, one linear interpolation along this edge, one along this edge, one along this edge, and so on. Right. <clears throat> um, so that's a, that's, basically trying to strike a balance between computation time and accuracy. So it's, it's like almost a, a, a cross between these two. It's a middle ground between these two. 
So, yeah, I hope that answers your question. I'm going to put uh, uh, references for further reading uh, in the comments section. I do recommend Alex Talea's book on, um, on data visualization. Um, the information you get from books and research papers is going to be better than the information you get from Google. So Google will not answer all of your questions. And Wikipedia also cannot answer all of your questions. Maybe someday Wikipedia you can, but today, today you can't, um, which is why we love books so much. Um, thanks again to Gwening Chen and the computer science department here at the University of Houston. If you have questions or comments, uh, please let me know. And thank you for your attention.